Hi everyone, thanks for coming. So, my name is Will, for those who don't know me. Um, goal of this seminar is a bit undefined, to be totally honest. Uh, if you found yourself inside this room, then you're probably in some way interested in computation, logic, uh, potentially even geometry, uh, deep learning we'll be talking about later as well. Um, so personally, my avenue into these things is uh, predominantly from a logical background, coming into studying computation from a logical perspective. Uh, something that I haven't understood so far, but have recently been uh, trying to understand, uh, these objects called proof nets, right? So we have many different uh, systems of logic. Uh, some of them are more and less amenable to the study of computation. And what seems to be central are these objects proof nets, but I never quite understood why. Um, and so that's kind of been my goal recently, is to understand that. Uh, and indeed, there are a few things. I think the most important uh, realization of proof nets from my current naive perspective is uh, this program by Girard called Geometry of Interaction, which tries to interpret proofs from a geometric uh, perspective. Uh, I believe to varying levels of success at the moment. <clears throat> and so that's where I'm going to be heading towards. We're not going to get there in today's seminar, right? But the goal for today is to just get a very clear foundation of uh, two logical systems, a sequence style linear logic and as well as uh, proof nets. And I'm also going to be talking about translation from one into the other. Uh, if I have time at the end, I should be able to state the so-called sequentialization theorem uh, which gives you a condition for checking when a proof net does in fact arise from a sequence style linear logic proof. Um, and then the goal for the next lecture is going to be to prove that theorem. Okay, but today is all about foundations, right? So we're going to be very precise. Please ask lots of questions as we go. So let's start off with the definition. I'm going to begin by defining formulas. So let's assume uh, an infinite and we'll assume countable <laughs> so we begin with the atoms and this is just going to be some countably infinite set the notation that we're going to be using is P, Q, R, etc. Now, the one thing that <clears throat> I have to note about the atomic proof formulas is that we also assume that if uh, P is an element of this set, then the negation of P is also an element of that set. So negation P uh, is itself an atom. Okay, cool. Uh, that's a that's a really good question. I suppose not. So we have a pairing. Um, I do want to be able to read this though. So I want to be able to look at an atom and tell whether it's negation p or whether it's p. Okay. So if you were setting up some formalism, you'd have to do that as some kind of tuple. Yep. All right. Good question. Uh, a theme throughout today is you're going to see pre-definition followed by definition. So every time you see that, pre means kind of the raw object, and then I'm going to start taking equivalence classes of such things under an appropriate equivalence relation in order to get the truth in. Uh, let me just check the board to see how my writing's looking. It's audible but barely. Dan, have you seen some of these comments? Okay, that's all good. <clears throat> okay, I'll talk a bit louder so that people on Zoom can hear me. Okay, so we've got our atomic pre-formulas, and then I want to build up uh, pre-formulas from these. So, still going with the same definition.
so it's defined inductively, so we take the smallest set subject to the following. Okay, so I'm likely to drop the subscript of the tensor in the par. By the way, if you haven't seen this symbol before, it's a bit of a difficult one to draw. It's actually an upside down ampersand, right? And we call it par. So that's my best attempt at drawing it. You can have a look in the notes if you want to see the LaTeX version of it. Uh, okay, so I'm likely to drop those subscripts, but it just means the exact same thing. Okay, cool. So all of the atomic preformulas are preformulas themselves. And then we just build up with the following connectives. So if sound. I sound loud. <laughs> um, oh, bizarre. Okay, is that picking up enough? Might move it slightly closer. Okay. Comments are great. Great? Let's make it greater. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's a comment on the maths and not just the, in the microphone. Okay, cool. So sorry that happened in an awkward time in the middle of a definition. So let's just uh, recap. I'm just saying that the, pre, uh, the atomic preformulas are preformulas themselves. And then if I have two preformulas, I can construct new ones, which is just the tensor of it and also the par of it. Tensor is tensor. Tensor is sometimes pronounced times, but I normally call it tensor. Okay, cool. And the last thing is negation. Cool. And that's the end of the definition. And so now I've got uh, our pre formulas worked out. Okay, so now I want to give you the equivalence relation upon which we uh, define formulas. And it's essentially just moving negations in, right? So if I have the negation of a complex formula, I can move that negation inside the brackets and I want to identify those things. <clears throat> so let me define. Okay, so in the following, P is atomic, and then A and B are going to represent arbitrary preformulas. Okay, so the negation of P is just the atom negation P. If it already was negated, then this map acts identically. Double negations do cancel out. And then we have the multiplicative rules. So the negation of A tensor B is going to be identified with the negation of A par the negation of B. And then similarly, the negation of A par B maps to the negation of A tensor the negation of B. <clears throat> okay, cool. So this tells you what to do every time you have a negation out in front, but that might not be the case. In those cases, <clears throat> A 
then tensor B is just going to get mapped to gamma of A tensor gamma of B. And then similar for par, so this is a recursive definition. Okay, cool. So this was defined a bit differently in some of my old notes in case I saw them, but I fixed these up last night. Uh, thanks to Billy for noticing those. <clears throat> uh, hopefully that all makes sense. Okay, using this, there is a notion of a negation normal form uh, that's written out clearly in the notes. It's not actually something I'm going to be using today, so I'm going to skip over it for now. But just to say it out loud, you can apply this map a finite number of times until eventually it starts acting identically over and over and over again. Uh, once you get to that point when it's acting identically, then that formula that you've ended up with is going to be the negation normal form of the formula that you started with. Uh, in very layman's terms, it means that we've fully simplified the expression, right? So you've moved the negations in as far as you possibly can. <clears throat> may or may not be a helpful notion, it's not what I'm going to be using today, as I already said. Okay, so let me define formulas for you now. So if two things are related via this map, then we call them uh, equivalent, and then we just model by that equivalence relation, and we thus have formulas. Yep? Um, sorry, um, can we need an associator as well? Because that expansion would, um, would produce things that depends on the order of which we evaluate gamma, wouldn't it? So maybe I'm not being quite fair here. So I want to say this is the smallest equivalence relation such that this holds. And I think that you've taken this literally. So that's actually a fair point. Um, so if I say two things that you mentioned are going to be related by having a common ancestor. Because I'm taking the transitive closure now. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So now I want to head towards defining uh, sequence style linear logic for you using these formulas I've built up. But I'm going to be using sequence and I'm going to be using occurrences of formulas rather than just raw formulas themselves. So just two quick definitions first and then we can look in the logical system. So repeat them. Okay, sure. Ah, <clears throat> uh, so just a comment, basically only for Dan. These are where the variables are coming in. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm considering a linear logic s system with labelled variables. And so I'm just using integers here, but whatever. You can use x, y, z if you're more comfortable. <clears throat> what was that, sorry? Oh, uh, yeah, it is. Hey. So I've obviously been indoctrinated like a good PhD student. 
All right. Um, so that's an occurrence of a formula. And I might get lazy and just call them occurrences. So I'd be like an occurrence, that means an occurrence of a formula. It's not really worth writing down. Okay, and then a sequence is simply a finite sequence of occurrences. And we write it using this turnstile. Cool. So this definition of sequence is particularly simple because we're only looking at one-sided uh, uh, sequence for today. Yeah? Does A, like A1 refer to the... No, no, I, I thought that question was going to come. So Tom's question is, does A1 mean an occurrence AI where I is equal to 1? No. So. I mean, that's why I paused. I was like, I can call them whatever I want, but I wanted to say that it was finite and arbitrary. So if I write something like this and you see AI in the middle, that is referring to an occurrence, BJ, where A need not be equal to uh, B and I need not be equal to J. I don't think that's going to come up because I'm not going to be using this notation very much. <clears throat> Good question. Okay, sweet. Let's look at a logical system. So. I've got all these prefixes here. I'm just going to say deductional. <clears throat> okay, so the deduction rules are the heart of any logical system. They're going to tell us what are the valid deductions that you can and can't make inside your uh, logic. So we have the identity group. Which consists of axiom and cut. So this is one of those things where when I first started learning logic, I said to myself, I swear once I become an expert on this stuff, I'm not going to assume that this notation is easy to read, even though I'm completely uh, used to it at this point. So I'm going to be using this all over the place for like the next three or six weeks or something. So just make sure that this is very clear the way that you read this. Uh, the axiom one is probably slightly harder to read right from the very start than cut is. So let's start here. All I'm saying here is that if I had some proof of this sequence, right, so it's an inductive uh, definition, and I had another proof of this one, then I'm able to infer the bottom sequence, right? And the way that we think about it is these negation A's, they come from something that's on the left of the turnstile, if we were to look at the translation coming from intuitionistic uh, linear logic, right? And so the things on the left are hypotheses and the things on the right are possible conclusions. And so here we're kind of saying that we have assumed A and then here we have a proof of A, right? So if I'm able to prove delta and delta prime with the assumption A and I also have sitting there a proof of A, then that means I can just deduce uh, gamma, gamma prime, delta, delta prime without any of those A's. I'm just using the hypothesis here and then I'm inferring the conclusions there. Does the way that you read this make sense? Um, and then with the axiom, there's nothing above it, right? That's why it's an axiom. So we can just axiomatically assume that this is the case for any formula. Yep. Okay, and then there's more. So let me move this up. Because there are going to be some corresponding to the tensor and the pi rules that I've already introduced. <clears throat> and what are they? So yeah, these are the multiplicative rules. So the times rule or the tensor rule, uh, it's actually exactly the same as cut, by the way, which is a very helpful observation to make. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's 
smooth and shine. Good. And then we have paw. Cool. Does that make sense? And then for linear logic, we have but a single structural rule, which is exchange. How do you spell structural? Ah. Oh, because I'm an inconsistent human being, that's why. Oh, well, I guess because they preserve the position. This one, you can't really do that. I have to make a decision where I put the new thing, whereas here I can put it back where it was. I guess, what am I going to do? I'm going to defy you, Daniel. <laughs> I guess that's the reason why. Because my hand did it, that's why. <coughs> uh, and the single structural rule is exchange. <coughs> Which later we'll see proof nets themselves actually suppress. So there's no structural rules in proof nets. Oh, you've got to be careful with what you mean. It doesn't matter, right? So, yeah, if you're going to... I think that's a complicated question. Um, essentially, what I think that you're asking there is how do we start identifying proofs now that we've written this? Because there's going to be obvious things that are not meaningfully different as proofs from one another. So if I have a proof and I have an identical proof but I've just put a whole bunch of exchanges that mix stuff up and then, and then put them back into order, you'd say these are the same thing, right? Yeah, good question. I think the way to kind of work that out would be to identify the equivalence relation that actually makes the uh, translation from linear logic into proof nets, which I'm about to define, into an isomorphism once I mod out the domain by that equivalence relation, right? Um, but if you were to try to find a normal form of those equivalence classes, for example, then you're going to have to get nitty gritty as to uh, which pre-proof structures are the canonical ones and which ones aren't. And that's complicated. <clears throat> Sorry if that's not a very satisfying answer. Okay, and now I just want to quickly define what a proof is. So a proof, I'm still under the heading definition I believe, yep. And then a proof Oh, I'll write in brackets in MLL, right, in case that language ends up being needed. That's just multiplicative linear logic. <clears throat> you can see I only wrote multiplicative rules. You might be asking where are the additive ones. They're there, but we're not considering them today. A proof in MLL is a finite rooted planar tree in the sense of graph theory <clears throat> uh, with and let's get this convention right, the uh, edges are labelled by sequence. And nodes <coughs> accept the root are valid deduction rules. Does that make sense? With validity defined by uh, coherence with these rules that I've already defined. Maybe I can do a very, very quick example to make sure that this notation has been read properly.
Um, yeah, I guess I... That's a very trivial example, but you kind of see how you read it, right? So I've just got valid axiom rules at the leaves, and then I'm describing the proof just by using valid deduction rules from there. Cool. So what have you proved it? I haven't proven anything. I've only made a whole bunch of uh, definitions. I'm just trying to give an oh, example. Sorry, you oh, what have I actually proved? This is very, so you've got to keep in mind that. Um, I don't know if this is really the best way of thinking about it, but in my head, these like fully negated things, they're essentially hypotheses, right? So if I can be a little bit dodgy, I'll put this in inverted commas. I identified this with, with that, right? And so if I was doing intuitionistic statement calculus and I'm able to put things on the left, then I would just have A tensor B. So I've just, I've just shown that A tensor B implies itself. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually not as trivial as you might think. So reading it backwards, it goes to show that I can um, either take this as an axiom rule, or if I only had the pieces initially, then I would be able to infer this rule, right? Which is actually eta equivalence. So if you know eta equivalence from uh, lambda calculus, the way that that presents itself inside proof systems, generally speaking, is that uh, it's the difference between whether you allow axiom, am I pointing, do I have it? Yeah, axiom, uh, whether they're general formulas or whether they're atoms, right? So it actually doesn't matter, and you can see that via this proof. Does that make sense? Sweet. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good point. So I just don't want to lean too heavily on my personal background, you know. But yeah, sure. The way I'm thinking about these things, I come from an intuitionistic world. We only have one thing on the right and a whole bunch of stuff on the left. And the stuff on the left is read as conjunctions. So commas are conjunctions. So these are my set of hypotheses. I assume this and I assume this and I assume this. And then I'm able to prove this. And in intuitionistic systems, you only allow one thing on the right-hand side of the turnstile. If I were to go to a classical system and I allow multiple things on the right-hand side of the turnstile, then we read those commas as disjunctions, right? So the things on the left, it's like, if I assume the conjunction of all of this stuff, then I can prove the disjunction of the stuff on the right, yeah? And then that kind of reflects itself here. So assuming nothing, we can assume that either A is true or not A is true, right? That's, that's just an axiom. I'm saying A implies A there. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's a really good point. So yeah, you can see here that I can just par everything together, right, via this rule. And so the right-hand side of the turnstile in linear logic is the par. Cool. Okay, so that's the sequence style linear logic system that I was talking about, just a multiplicative fragment of it at least. Now I want to start talking about proof structures and then I'm going to define what a proof net is. <clears throat> okay, cool. So what do we have? A multiplicative proof structure <clears throat> Uh, maybe I'll just flag right from the start. Um, these aren't synonyms, so you've heard me talking about proof nets, and I'm defining proof structures. Uh, this in a sense, but in a different sense it's not. This is a pre-notion, right? So we're going to define proof structures, and then the strict subset of which is going to consist of our proof nets. So what they consist of is a finite... <clears throat> A 
finite set of occurrences. of formulas and a finite set of lengths. And I'll tell you what a link is. <clears throat> Can you what, sorry? No, I'm disallowing that. Yeah, so I'm, that's going to be one of the conditions for a proof structure. Yeah, and um, I was going to say out loud, I'm the only one that does that. So I haven't seen that explicitly done anywhere else, right? So I think that Gerard is implicitly doing that. That's why I wrote it in explicitly, but I haven't seen anyone anywhere say we don't allow the same occurrences of, um, occurrences of formulas. But the tricky thing with that is there might be a clever reason why it's forced upon us, like what we had in our um, against them, it's, it's like a uh, duality paper. Uh, there might be some subtlety where if you allow or disallow for it, you get a different result, but I haven't been able to find something like that yet. <clears throat> something, to, something to ponder on. Okay, cool. So let's look at these links. So we have axiom links. <clears throat> Which are just tuples. Right, so axiom lengths just uh, a pair of occurrences, but we require that one of them is A and the other one's not A. <clears throat> uh, and these are both conclusions. Of the axiom link. So I want to make this very clear. I'm going to be talking both about premises and conclusions of particular links. And then later I'm going to be talking about premises and conclusions of full proofs, right? So you want to just set, your, set that up inside your head that you read that differently. There, there could be an occurrence of a formula which is going to be a conclusion of a link that is not a conclusion of a proof. But for now we're just looking at uh, conclusions of links. And then you can also have a tensor link, which is one of the following two. Just shift it up a bit. I actually need to think for a second whether I'm taking cut links. Um, maybe I'll think about that whilst I write this up. So I'm definitely taking tensor ones. Oh, that's a good point. Okay, I'm taking too long. I'll see if I can get this definition out at least. Um, so one thing this confused me for a little bit, just want to flag it. Uh, you've got these like mirrored versions of it, right? So here I'm saying A and B. A, we can, uh, it makes sense for me to say the left premise and the right premise here because I've got a tuple, right? So there is a sense of order with these things. And you can see that I can construct A tensor B. I haven't made a typo here. This is not meant to be B tensor A. So I can make A tensor B both with A on the left or on the right. And they're two different links. <clears throat> okay, and then par link, which is very similar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I don't have a set name. Yeah, we'll just leave those stated out loud So for the camera. Um, a, I, not A, J, these are elements of our finite set of occurrences. And same with B, J, I, J, and then A tensor, sorry, A, I, and then A tensor B, K in all of these definitions. Uh, good, and then we also have the symmetrical version of this, or the mirrored version, whatever you want to say. Okay, and I am taking cut links, I've decided. So. 
cut links reflect axiom links. So. And then what I'm going to say here is that AI, not A, J, <coughs> are premises. Uh, right, because you can see here, do I still have it written? Cut eliminated the A and the not A, right? So we're just going to link those two things together, which makes them, um, which nulls them out as uh, conclusions of the entire proof. And then for axiom, we have the opposite way around. Their, their premises there. Okay, cool. And so we draw these things diagrammatically. <laughs> well, I was trying to kind of push through the definition. I can say it out loud. I can write it if you wanted. Well, well, that's why I've written our premises. So here their conclusions and here their premises. I haven't spelt it out in the tense or in the par, but I'm hoping that's clear because the first two are going to be premises and the last one's going to be conclusion. There are occurrences and then by definition we refer to them as premises. So if I do that, maybe that makes more clear what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> We've defined it to be a premise. <laughs> I haven't inferred that it's a premise. How's my blackboard technique? So we draw these things diagrammatically. So I guess I can show you what I mean and also give you an example of a proof structure at the same time. So I've got this one over here. I can give you what that looks like in proof nets. We're going to write A, not A, and we're going to link it. Right? So I'm suppressing the explicit labeling of the occurrences here, but they're written in different parts of the page, and so you should be able to infer that they're distinct. Oh, wait, sorry, I haven't actually, oh, I'm jumping ahead. So there are conditions on these proof structures, which I haven't actually written yet. Ugh. Okay. Okay, continued on star, where star is over here. So yeah, let me just finish this off and then I'll give you an example. So we do have some conditions on proof structures uh, and they are the following. So all All occurrences are distinct, and as I said earlier, I'm the only person that actually says that, so let me put a little flag there for the experts. Um, and every... Well, it says, it's just reminding me that the word set appears Well, that's, that's what I thought. That's why I was like, I think that he's doing it. All right, yeah. <clears throat> um, Uh, so I didn't really hear it. Yeah. Do you want to allow A comma zero and B comma zero where A and B are distinct formulas? That's a good question. Yeah, I don't see I don't see anything okay. I don't I'm not doing anything fancy with these systems yet. I just don't think I'm the one to ask at this point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define the translation from the sequence style linear logic into proof nets, right? And if I, I'm going to, you need to see the definition to see the problem, but I'm going to do that inductively. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if you give me a sequence style linear logic proof, then you can take this as instructions for building the proof net, right? But when I'm doing that construction, 
I might have in my system of linear logic some variable a over here or formula a and then way further down another formula a and I need to be able to distinguish those two things for when I'm actually drawing my links between it. So I want to say there's going to be a unique um, occurrence of a formula inside the linear logic sequence style proof and then grab that thing and then draw a link between it and something else. I can't do that if the sequence style system is just taking formulas and then the proof nets are taking occurrences of formulas. And so all I did was I like chucked in these integers in order to make sure that I'd be able to make a well-defined map there, right? So if you had A1 and then B1, I'm still able to do that. I'm still able to infer that there is a unique label in so that I can grab the correct thing when I'm trying to do that inductive definition. So for my extremely basic result, which is there exists a translation from one to the other, it doesn't matter. If I were to do something more fancy with it, <clears throat> then maybe such a thing would... You are making me think though, when, when, we were, when Dan and I were working on intuitionistic sequence calculus, we did disallow that. We, we weren't allowed to have Sure. Well, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say in that case. Um, yeah, let's finish this. Every occurrence of a formula is a premise. Okay, these are, these are pretty basic uh, requirements, right? So I'm not concluding the same thing for multiple links, etc. I think you'll see the intuition once I finish off this example. So going back to my example earlier, the, uh, yeah, then we're going to make it look like cool. So that's the proof net corresponding to that uh, sequence style linear logic proof. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Premises are drawn above conclusions below. Yeah. I think I disagree with myself now as well. Maybe we should talk about this afterwards. But yeah, we did allow it in our thing. So I think that I don't want to rule out your suggestion. And that's my final answer. And I'll defend that till I die. Okay, cool. Okay, let me do a quick time check because I want to define this translation. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let me give you the translation. Do you have a class in here? Do you have a class in here? No, no. Oh, you don't? Sorry, I was like... No, that's okay. That's okay. All good. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, sweet. So let's get this on the board. Okay, so as I said, it's inductive. Basically, what we want to do is look at your uh, second style proof and then use that as instructions in order to build your proof net, right? Okay, cool. Oh, I should write that.
So this is the crucial point with the occurrences. This is the thing that I was trying to say, right? I'm doing this inductively. I'm saying take t of pi 1 and take t of pi 2. And then what I'm suppressing here in my notation is that I'm saying there will exist some conclusion a in t of pi 1 and some conclusion not a in t of pi 2, right? And I want those that a and that not a to correspond to this a and that not a, right? So if that had occurrences but this didn't, then I wouldn't be able to infer that. And then once I've got that, I then draw a conclusion link between the two of them. And that's going to be my definition of t of this entire thing. <clears throat> All right, feel free to ask a question while I write the other one aside. Yes, that's what I'm thinking at the moment. Uh, so yeah, this is very similar to cut, cut and tensor. Uh, oops, but not that similar. So here I'm insisting t of pi is going to have two conclusions, a and b, and we link those two. <clears throat> okay, cool, there's one more because let's not forget about exchange. At least two conclusions, yeah. Well, what I really meant there was it will have two that are a and b, yeah. And then exchange actually just gets suppressed, right? So this is not an injective link. <clears throat> Sorry, it's not an injective function. There is a class. <clears throat> well, at least I got this definition out. So that's the translation, right? And then just to give it away a little bit, the reason why we do this, and the one thing that proof nets have that other logic systems I have never seen, like any, any, any analog to, is we're then going to start talking about these things called trips around the proof, right? And this is where everything lies. This is where you get, this is the foot in the doorway into geometry of interaction, et cetera. But we want to say that the proof nets are the um, proof structures that lie in the image of this map, right? We want to know that they've actually come from valid proofs. And so if I just gave you a proof net, how would you know that, right? I don't want to have to explicitly, pardon? If I just gave you a proof structure. If I gave you a proof structure, sorry, yes. If I gave you a proof structure, then how would you know that it's a proof net? That's the question that we're trying to answer, right? And the answer is like totally awesome. I can't, I can't believe it really. So there's this notion of switching and they correspond to kind of instructions of how your trip gets uh, permeated through the proof as you write it. So let me give you an example, and this can be like a little... Uh, you think we don't have time for this? Ah, it's the coolest bit. All right, tune in next time for the coolest bit. <laughs> okay, thanks, no worries. <laughs>